I'm Roger LeMate. I'm the president and CEO of UX Corporation. UX, one of the oldest training juniors in the space. We are we have a large portfolio of projects with that are focused towards the development ready end of the spectrum. Uh, our vision is to become one of the next developers of uranium in Canada and the Athabasca Basin. But one of our extreme advantages is we have an incredible portfolio that will keep us sustainable in the long term beyond a single project. And we believe that creates a unique investment opportunity for uranium investors, particularly focused in North America. Roger, welcome back. Um, we had a great conversation last time out. You kind of broke down the sequence of events, timing, sort of making around the JCU Denison uh, deal. The admin continues though, so there's more to discuss. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. For anyone new to uranium investing or indeed UEX, there's a sort of a long, um, list of uh, interviews that we've done previously with Roger, which you can go to. We'll put the links up below. So do have a look at that one. So Roger, you did a bought deal, raised 21.2 million bucks. Um, I'll say, I kind of casually, flippantly refer to that as admin, but it, it is though, isn't it? You've got to get these deals, you've got to get this deal done. Yeah, I think for us, you know, when we look forward to where things were going, the last thing we wanted to do is to put all this energy into the JCU deal. Uh, get to the finish line and then essentially lose the opportunity because we couldn't finance it at the right time. And yeah, I think that was that was the key reason behind why we did what we did uh, last week. Timing sucked. <laughs> it certainly did. I, I wish when we, uh, you know, we can always look back and say, when was the right time to do it? Uh, we do have constraints in front of us that we couldn't, couldn't deal with, plus sort of a vision of where things were going. If you, if you look at the end of June, uh, uranium equities have been sitting flat for a while. We had a, our company had a teeny little spike in and around the deal flow news. Um, we sort of sat there and said, okay, well, we looked at the market. We looked at what the experts were saying in the market, saying, you know, and our shareholders saying, don't, don't finance. We got this interest-free loan from Denison for six months or for three months and six total. Uh, don't, don't, let's wait till the September, October, get the best price. And then, Okay, we, we, we sort of thought about that. We said, okay, we, we should wait, see where the market is moving. And uh, unfortunately, the market moved in the direction we didn't want it to move in. And since our deal at uranium equities across the border down, uh, we're seeing more risk in the space uh, with you know the fourth wave coming, et cetera. We don't know where the macro fundamentals are going. We, but the biggest driver for us was, do you want to end up in a situation? We would love to have done a prospectus financing with the ad bringing on these new projects. The, there was a risk that the regulator would say, no, we want 43, 101 reports on all these before you can do a prospectus financing, which was several weeks to months away from being able to be done. So we're stuck doing private placement bot deal kind of scenario, which is not a bad place to be by any stretch, but there comes a point in time where the price, you have limits on the amount you can raise. And, and we were worried about dropping below the price that we could do a deal and, and cover our costs. And then end up, you know, if we don't cover the cost of our, our deal with Denison and the loans, then we end up uh, giving them the entire 100% of the assets. And we didn't want to do that. We thought it was the best, you know, it's not the best scenario, we would argue we could have done it a couple of weeks earlier. And I won't argue with that because the, the data is there. But at the end of the day, taking the risk of losing the assets was just too much for our shareholders and we had to protect their interests. I'm glad you mentioned the perspective. I was going to ask you about that. So that, that was a no-go because the time frame needed to actually get 43 one ones in place would have taken you over the time frame that Denison had given you in terms of this loan. Um, did you have a conversation? Did you try to have a conversation with them about extending that? They'd have been understanding, surely. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, no, we didn't have that conversation. I don't think to be to be fair, uh, both parties, while we're friends, and you know, uh, would we give the extension if the roles were reversed? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And and to be fair. I look at our stock price have been trading flat since you know the middle of July uh, because people didn't think we could raise the, raise the money. And I think if we had sent the signal that we wanted an extension, that would have would have also hurt the stock price in the long term. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's probably right. So um, tell us about the deal. You did it what twenty nine cents, something like that. Twenty nine cents uh, has a half warrant uh, attached to it with a three year term. Uh, it gets us all the money we need to pay off our friends at Denison to own this outright. And since it's a bot deal financing, there's no risk on our end. Right. We talked previously, you want a bit more money from that because you got actually, you're getting the, the, okay, let's, let's stick with the deal. So in terms of getting the deal over the line, there's, I, there's going to be, there's a menage a trois here. There's three of you. 
um, in this conversation. Um, when when does the paperwork finally get signed? Is it, the money's going to be an important part of it, but you've also got to get the paperwork done. Is that nearly complete or is it complete? Well, it's done. It's, it's done. done. Right. The, the deal is completely done. It, it happened concurrently with the purchase of JCU. Right. So I think I think we own JCU right for probably about twenty five minutes. Excellent. Before the process moved over and it was fifty percent sold to to Dennis, and they were they went hand in hand. Right. Okay. So that was that was concurrent. Brilliant. Um. So that so that's the deal aspect of it. You need more money to do other things because you've got a portfolio of companies. You've got some new assets here. You've got to, you've got to work out what what you want to do. You've got to start paying back all of this money that you're spending. So are you gonna are you going to be coming to the market with for more money? I'm not really sure about that. And to be brutally honest, I think it comes down to what the JCU project portfolio looks like for 2022. Uh, we inherited, I don't think people realize, we inherited $5.8 million from J- with JCU's acquisition. So when you look at the $41 million purchase price, we you know it's actually more like 35 and a half because we netted out uh, uh, that five and a half, $5.8 million. And that will keep, you know, the question will be how many of the JCU projects are going to be up and running in next year. We anticipate realistically on a, that it's only going to be Wheeler River next year based on what we've known now, but that's, those budgets get decided uh, over the next three months. Uh, if, if it goes the way we expect it, we do not necessarily need to raise any more money. So explain what you mean about that. You own this, or you own 50% of the JCU assets. Right. So what do you mean you've got to sit back and wait what, what well, is done? Well, because JCU is not the operator of these projects. Uh, the, the budgets are decided by the joint venture and the majority the majority kind of rules on these things. And so you know, our, there are three partners uh, that are operators, are Cameco, Arano, and Denison. Denison, of course, controls Weeder River, and what they do with Weeder River will have a major impact on the JCU budget. Uh, what Cameco and Arano decide to do on the other projects, like Millennium and Kikovic and such, uh, will have an impact on the budget. Right now, we don't anticipate a ramp up of an expenditures at JCU based on the dialogues we're having with those partners, but those decisions aren't ultimately made until October-ish. Uh, we get a sense of them right now, uh, but right now the sense that we have is that it's not going to mean something we have to do and we can probably hold off on raising money for the purposes of jcu we have you know over five million dollars in the bank right now with within the ux proper so we're not in an urgent need to raise money we we could consider it but i don't believe we want to do it where we are today we we raised what we needed today to to get the denison deal closed okay the loan term okay so you, you got an initial bump when you announced the deal and obviously you know there was there was a process you went through with Denison and JCU sub- subsequently. Do you think that um, people are giving you credit for where you've ended up, or do you think it's actually been more of a negative? Oh boy, um, I don't think the more. I think there's a little more. If I had to say slightly negative, not not immensely negative, I think that's kind of where we end up. It's probably in that place. Um, of course, I disagree, or otherwise we wouldn't have done the deal. <laughs> right. So. Yes, I do believe uh, there's there's some disappointment about not owning at all. Um, I understand that. I'm I would be lying if I said that we weren't disappointed that we didn't own it all either. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I think we have to wait and see what the market feels after we paid off to our friends at Denison uh, their share of our, our obligations. What they see, how they see this working out at the end of the day. Uh, okay. For UX long term, this is a really important transaction, and even only owning fifty percent is an important transaction. Okay, so with with with, with Cameco and, and Arano, uh, Millennial and Kikovic, there's you don't get a sense yet, and maybe you will in October that you're going to have to you know raise any money for that. So we'll, we'll park that up for for now. We'll come back to it. But with Wheeler River, you said that that looks like things will move forward. Denison are what's sitting on ninety five percent effectively near Stanley. And um, you are, end up with five percent of that. Are you going to be committed? So, any of your cash being committed by Denison um, to move that forward? That you're aware of to move forward. Uh, I when I look at where they're at, I'm anticipating a, a budget about similar to what they did last year, based on where they are in the development cycle. So, uh, money out of UX right now? No. Okay. No, I don't believe so, because it's already residing in JCO. Right. So, so to that end, you, so you, you, you this bought, year's budget for JCU is about two point six million dollars, right? Which we're in, and so if that were the case, with very little overhead in JCU and money in the bank, they're already we're we're yeah. pretty good spot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, and to to that end, in terms of the deal, the assets that you've got are all about 
future value and it's possibly baked in to you know people's thinking about you yeah. know where where you're at where your value at the moment so should we talk about what you're going to do to kind of with your five million bucks which is going to you know gives you control of how you drive value because we've had lots of conversations about the size of your portfolio where you focus what's going on so what what are what are you doing in the background once you've got through your admin process that you're going to come back and focus on so we're we're we've already told the market that we're going to be working at christie lake this summer following up along the trend so that will happen very shortly uh it's been a bit of a nightmare from a uh, uh the, the gold people have really made a mess of the drilling opportunities in canada right now uh gold companies with their big run uh, last year raised an awful lot of money and now they're being employed in the ground and they've pretty much taken drills all over the country uh, including small time players who, who play regionally uh, and taking them across the country. And we found it really hard to get a drill for the summer program at Christie Lake and it's delayed because of drill availability, but nothing more. Uh, so that will be our biggest focus. We've done a little bit of, uh, of work on our Hidden Bay project next uh, this summer or this last winter, sorry, that follow up from the encouraging results got just north of the rate parachute deposit will be something we look at again in the fall probably uh, closer to, to, to January, where we get back out in the field to do that. And we're still working with our friends at, at, uh, on Shea Creek, moving that forward. But that's that's a that's a discussion with Arano that's ongoing and, and not happening at a pace that anyone, including them, probably likes. But we're trying. Okay. But our focus, our focus, you know, the, I think when I vision where our company goes in the next three years, it's all about uh, exposure to the to the JCU projects with in particularly Weeder River with that production visibility. And so our shareholders have that sort of luxury of being able to see the shareholder, to see that potential production. But because it's we're not the majority owners, we don't have to put all the resources into the ground. We can still focus on growth the uranium on our on our growth projects, the mid-stage and resource level projects. And that's where you're going to see our focus. Because we're financially we're not crushed by having to deal with funding these uh, these these the uh, ex studies and, and, and development stories. Okay. Why did you sell shares before you raised money? Why did I sell shares? Yeah. Because I had options that were expired <laughs> expiring. And it was pretty, I, I could, I, I don't know how many people would probably leave money on the table let the options expire. Right. So it was, it was again, a, that, down to unfortunate timing in terms of the optics or is it, was that well known? You think? I don't believe that's well known. I'm mean, certainly, you know, you look back at the optics and say, yeah, it wasn't great. I'm not going to lie. I we didn't have more than a couple more days to exercise those options. And for insiders, we had been on blackout for six and a half months, or six six months and what five days. Hmm. Uh, we were in blackout since before Christmas. Right. So uh, we had when we were in blackout and the options come due, you have to exercise them. So. I wish I wish I could have held on to them because I would have rather have gotten about more more for them than what they're worth, but or than what I sold them for at the time. But right, what, are you going to be buying more soon? I certainly hope so. That is certainly the plan. Our our company has you know we've we've rec we've recognized the challenge that people say about not owning enough stock. So we're putting we've put in a plan for all directors and and, and uh, officers to be buying stock to a certain level and it's not it's been approved but i'm not we're not ready to say exactly what that looks like but it's right. not not unsubstantial but you pretty much on par with where our peers are going okay are ubx kind of reminds me of where you guys what presently reminds me of where you were, guys were last year right you know um, where there are lots of catalyst moments coming and going at great expectations nothing really sort of manifests itself and we recently had sput the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, uh, you know, come as the, you know, the 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 new guy in the new guy in town, which is going to change everyone's fortunes. And it's, I'm not sure it's quite done that, in the sense that you know they've they made the announcement, people got excited. I think you know equities rose, um, and they did the at the market recently, 300 million, and it's like no one cared. Do you think this is another? failed catalyst moment for the uranium space? Is there something bigger going on that we should be aware of? It could be. It could be. We certainly seen this cycle happen before where people get their interest up and things wane down the backside. 
I personally would look to where we see third quarter earnings for groups like Cameco and such. The second quarter has in, in, in the summer months have always been dis- historically difficult for uranium equities. Why? Uh, but it, a lot of it has to do with where where companies like Kazadam Prom and Cameco with their sales. And they, if you look back decades in Cameco's history, of course, second quarter is always weak because that's where deliveries are at their lowest levels. And usually the fourth quarter is extremely strong and exceeds people's expectations, wherever they might be. So yes, I think that that's part of it. Part of that's the doldrum. Part of it is, you know, we I think people do hear the story over and over again. And I, I can I can recall, I mean, it reminds me again, like I've said before, we're, we're, we, I remember joining the uranium industry in 2001 and hearing it's coming and the 2000 it's coming and three it's coming, four it's coming. People go, okay, it didn't come this time. I'm, I'm out, I'll wait till it changes. And uh, I think we have to wait to see where the third quarter goes. I, I do believe there, there's, the Sprouts raised this money at the at, or doing this at the market thing. We'll see how it impacts the the short term supply and psychology of the utility buyers, uh, whether they think it's there. I think what encouraged me was listening to Cameco's uh, call here recently about how um, how people are sort of seeing off market uh, contracting interest. And you know, I don't think people can underscore how important that is for the starting of the changing of the psyche. It doesn't it doesn't start. Like from A to Z in 10 seconds, it's all a bit of a ramp up, but it is a little bit of an exponential ramp up. And then when people hit that magical tipping point, they start to panic and we're not there yet. Will it be this fall when things are, are not happening? I, I, I'm running in company. If I knew that I would sit on a beach somewhere for sure and, and, and call in my trades, but uh, it's a tough, it's a difficult thing to forecast because you have to get in the minds of the utilities and where they're at and, um, I'm encouraged by the subtle changes in the language and subtle changes in, in the, the approach. Um, but where we are, uh, I honestly can't say. I cannot understand where we're at right now in the market. I can't understand why, uh, if I'm not a utility, I'm not trying to tie things up at $40, $50 right now to make protect myself from the long term. Uh, but as long as utilities can find scraps and bits and pieces here and there, they can defer sales. But we, we've seen them do everything that they can to work back down the value chain from enrichment through down to and UEP through to to UF6, and now we're starting to see the, you know, uh, I was in courtesy Cameco actually put nine million pounds into contracts this year because that I don't think they were able to do that last year, and that's in the first half of the year. So things are starting to change, but I whether Sprouts the magical potion that pushes us over the edge, um, I, obviously we hope that's the case, but. It may or may not be, depending how much more loose stuff might still be out there. It's, it's interesting to me because it seems there's the beginnings of conversations from some companies saying we have or we are about to sign contracts. And it strikes me there's there's contracts and there's contracts. The words are important. You know that. You've been through masses of documents in the last two or three weeks. Um, but the headlines will read contracts. And then maybe that's what the market needs. But the reality is there's not that many companies at the moment he can deliver into those contracts, apart from your Kazat and Prom, the Camacos of this world, the Uzbeks. Um, so do you expect to sort of see more companies trying to talk talk this language of yes, we've got a we've got a contract signed, but there's been there's no substance to it. I mean what happened last time around? Is that a way it oh, works? boy. <laughs> You're right. There's contracts and there's contracts. And I think the trick for someone trying to read what a value of the contract is, is just how much of the volume of that producer, potential producers being taken up by the contract. So what I mean by that is if, if you, if someone says, you know, I, I signed a contract for a hundred thousand pounds that can be delivered any time between five and 10 years from now at the whim of the, of the, uh, of the utility, well, that's an option. That's yeah. not a contract. That's yeah. an option. And quite frankly, the utility will have covered that off from a contract, the flex terms in a contract from a major company like a Cameco or Kazadam Prom. And that's all about trying to, from a utility point of view, trying to show there's more supply out there than there really is. And so I think if you look at a term and saying, hey, someone's just signed a contract for a five, 10 year window that produces 25% of their production over that period of time, that's a meaningful contract. And that is 
the signpost that things are changing. Right. And we, we will be looking out for that for sure, because I, I suspect there'll be a lot more jiggery pokery and smoke and mirrors on that front post October, because uh, we're already sniffing it. Um, okay. I like that. I like that description. Well, look, I'm. Roger, um, I appreciate you coming on and talking to us because I know it's been sort of difficult period. People haven't understood the constraints that you've had to operate under, and you know, and that's fine. People, not everyone's going to understand the difference between a board deal and a prospectus deal, and the, you know, the, the regulatory components and the obligations that you're you're under. But uh, you, you've helped explain it a little bit. If there's anyone watching this who's got more questions, um, we will send them to us, and we will. You know, try and answer the best we can, and um, yeah, keep coming on and let us know how you get on. I'm particularly intrigued as to how you move forward with Christy Lake, etc. So come on and talk to us regularly, okay? Okay, absolutely love to talk to you. Enjoy the conversations.